a dear family friend for quite a few years now um, who we trust implicitly with our hearts, with the heart of this church. He is a presbyter over this church, uh, an overseer, and uh, has a ministry around the world as a prophet. He's a proven. Um, he travels a ridiculous amount of miles and probably, I don't know, two-thirds of your life probably at least, right? All around the world, nations, he's a prophet to the nations. We honor him. We honor the gift of God in his life, but we honor the man of integrity that he is also. So it is a great honor and pleasure to welcome you, David. Oh, children, we're not welcoming you yet. Wait. <laughs> Release the children, thank you. Ages 4 to 11, over here. To Hollis and Gabe, thank you. Miss Laura. Look how beautiful they are, huh? There goes Michael. All right. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, thank you, Dave, for coming. Amen. Well, good morning, Harvest. How are you? It's great to be with you today. And, uh, I'm like King David when he said these words. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And uh, I love that song about in my father's house, there's a place for me. And uh, isn't that amazing that in our father's house, there's a place for us. Every one of us has a seat at the table uh, and it's the preferred seat because you're the favorite of God. Each one of us are favorite. Each one of us belong to him. And um, I, I love this house. I love the vision of this house. I agree with Brother Rob about just the goodness of God and, and the presence of God. Um, one of the things that marks uh, places for me, I, I do I travel around the world. I'm in hundreds of meetings every year. Uh, but there's certain places that are marked by the presence of God. And I can live without a lot of things, but I refuse to live without the presence of God. Amen? Uh, I, I don't care about good church. I don't care about a nice meeting. I know that in the presence of God, everything in me changes. I can come to church and not be changed, but I can't encounter God and not be changed. Are you hearing me? I can come to church and choose not to be changed, but I can't in truly encounter God without being changed. Every time I come into his presence, something in me changes. And this is a, a house that's marked me. And uh, I've been in covenant relationship for uh, seven years. I started coming, was invited by another ministry that was doing a school hosted by the Harvest and uh, fell in love with uh, the pastors and, and became good friends. And, and uh, I, I used a word a second ago that I don't use lightly. It's the word covenant. Uh, really, I'm in covenant relationship with, with Pastor Dan, with, uh, with the harvest on purpose. See, I believe in this world, there's contracts. Everything's done with a contract, right? You can't buy a house without uh, a contract. You can't get a cell phone really without a contract unless you want to pay more money for it. You, contracts are based on distrust. They're there to protect you if somebody didn't keep up with their end of the bargain or the deal. And, and you can take somebody to court if they don't pay you or do what they say they're supposed to do. But in the kingdom of God, we're built on covenant, which is based on trust. It's trusting God in everything with all things, but it's also being the trusted of the Lord. How many know that God initiates covenant? Yes. And this is a covenant church, a covenant house. And covenant's very important because I, I say it like this, when covenant breaks down, all hell breaks loose. Right? You, you watch where people are divided, where people are coming against each other. When covenant breaks down, all hell breaks loose. So the greatest thing we have is covenant. That's why marriage is a marriage covenant. I, uh, I use this word really when I refer to the harvest in just very few ministries. I've married my ministry with the harvest. It's, it's a strong word, right? Because... I become one. It means this. I'd give my life for, I'd give my life for this place. I'd give my life for the vision. I'd give my life for your pastor. And uh, I, I love your pastor. Do you love your pastor? Uh, how many know? Yeah, come on. Give God a shout of praise for, uh, for your pastor. How many know sometimes in the course of, of ministry, life happens? 
Just because we preach every Sunday and we're ministering to people and, and we're called by God doesn't mean that we don't go through the same struggles and, and, and life things that those of us who listen to us every Sunday go through. And uh, I've known Pastor Dan uh, for many years now. He's, he's served in full-time ministry here at the Harvest for, for 13 years, for f- about five years. He's been the lead pastor. And this I know to be true. Uh, in that time, he's never taken a vacation. He's gone on trips, but always to do ministry or to help somebody else's ministry. Uh, And in that process, sometimes life happens and you just need a break to restore your soul, get refreshed, uh, get let God minister to you, get filled up. Uh, With that in mind, uh, a week ago, Pastor Dan contacted me and um, allergies in Southwest Florida. Um, he, he, he contacted me and said, uh, David, I just really need to take a break. And, uh, so he, he asked the board, um, if he could take a sabbatical and, uh, they blessed him to do that. And he asked me to come to kind of just share with you, uh, and, and, and bring confidence, uh, to the house that everything's all right. Okay. Will you, will you trust me? Will you trust your pastors, your, your board and your leaders? Um, and, and. And, and he, so he, we've, we've granted him, the board's granted him a leave of absence. We're not going to put a time on it because he just needs some time away. And when he's ready, uh, he'll, he'll come back. Um, but in his stead or in his, in his absence, he will be here, uh, a part of the church. He just won't uh, have to carry the load of, of ministry. He can receive and be received. But we also want to be able to send him away to a, a pastoral retreat where people specialize in and just pouring into pastors. And, and how many know when you're in ministry, it's a whole different level of, of, of things. And so uh, we want to be able to send him there. So maybe over the next few weeks, uh, you may want to give a little extra in your tithes and your offerings just to help us cover the expense to send him uh, to, that, to, to that place. Uh, but with that in mind, um, you still love your pastor, right? Yeah. Amen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to listen. Rob said something. Rob said something very profound, um, very honoring. He thanked Pastor Dan for his transparency. Uh, and so I'm going to ask Dan to come, and we just want to bless him uh, as a church. So will you just give God a shout of praise again for Pastor Dan as he comes? And, um, so th- this is what, what, what I really believe. Uh, the Bible says we should give honor to whom honor is due. Right? We, we, we love the man, but we honor the call of God, the gift of God uh, on his life. And so I'm going to ask the, those of the board that are here, family members to come. Let, let's just surround uh, Pastor Dan this morning. And as a church, going to ask you to stand up, stretch your hands uh, towards, uh, towards him. And uh, more than ever before, um, I believe just as a body, right? I, I just really believe we just need to come together stay uh, steadfast in his, uh, uh, on his sabbatical. Uh, I will tell you that uh, Pastor Jim and Peggy, uh, they're going to be carrying the ministry load. I'm going to be coming in uh, as much as possible, probably every uh, other week or so to help carry the ministry load. Pastor Boyan Jancic from New York, also in covenant relationship, uh, is coming. Uh, people, uh, Aaron Miller from, from Washington, Pennsylvania, uh, Dave Fitzgerald, who led us in worship this morning. We're all going to carry the load. Amen. Because the church is family, right? Uh, and so I uh, just, Father, we just bless this amazing pastor today. Lord, we bless our friend, our brother. We bless this son. Lord, as much as we love him and honor him, Lord, you love him more. You honor him more. And Lord, I thank you that, uh, Lord, sometimes pastors need to be pastored. Shepherds need to be shepherded. And Lord, you're the good shepherd. And so, Lord, I'm asking that you would father Dan, you would father him, you would pastor him, you would shepherd him, that you would bring him into a place of refreshing, that Lord, you would restore the joy of salvation, that Lord, you would bring peace to his heart, to his mind, that Lord, this would be a time of visitation and habitation, God, that you would uh, possess him, Lord, over these next few weeks, that you would fill him up to overflowing. Lord, you'd give him a vision for the next 10 years of this house. You would speak life into his very being. 
Lord, I thank you that as he focuses on his family, Lord, his family is going to grow spiritually. Lord, they're going to increase. They're going to prosper. They're going to be happy, holy, and healthy, and at peace with nothing missing and nothing broken. Lord, you want him to prosper even as his soul prospers and be in health. And so, Lord, we release that over him and to him. Lord, we as a church declare that we have his back, that, Lord, we have his best entrance uh, at heart, that, Lord, the, the message and the move of God in this church will continue, that, Lord, we will fan the flame of the, the message of grace and faith and hope and love and the salvation and the good news of Jesus. And so, Lord, I ask right now that, Lord, you would move my friend, God. Lord, you would move my friend into the season of the miracle of miracles, God. I just kept hearing that in my spirit today as I woke up, Dan. God's going to give, bring you into a season of the miracle of miracles. And the things you've seen in the past are nothing compared to the things you're about to see in the future. And the things you've poured into so many, God's about to pour back into you a hundredfold, a thousandfold. Lord, I pray right now, according to Deuteronomy 1 and 11, that you would make him a thousand times greater. Lord, I silence every voice of the enemy. I silence every voice that's not the voice of God. I cancel every word spoken against him. Lord, and I declare right now that the blessings of God are about to overtake him. That, Lord, your favor is about to rest upon him. That, Lord, you're about to renew. You're about to renew things in him and for him and through him like he's never known before. Lord, I pray right now that, Lord, he would, that, Lord, the, there'd be a fresh fire. I heard these words together, and I feel like they're going to fall on the church today. I feel like they're going to fall in your life today and over the next few weeks. But God's coming with mercy and fire. The same grace you've shown everybody else, the same mercy you've shown everybody else is coming back to you today. Lord, I release that mercy and fire upon your son in Jesus' name. Amen. Now as a church, will you just pray this over him and say, say Lord Jesus, we bless our pastor to go and be refreshed. We will commit to him in this house to pray and to bless him and his family. We give him permission. We release him into the restoration of his soul. Lord, fill every empty place and bring him into a place of fresh fire and anointing. Let your presence surround him like a shield. We bless our pastor today. In Jesus' name, amen. I've got seed money for his trip. Right there. Amen. Okay. Thank you, brother. Bless you. Amen. Well, Happy New Year almost. Aren't you glad for new beginnings? What I love about every time we come to the new year is this, is, is, is this purpose. I believe that God calls us into new beginnings for this. There's a recalibration. There's a recalibration in the spirit. What would happen if you never changed the oil in your car? What would happen if you never rotated the tires or done the proper maintenance or, uh, you know, done the proper tune-ups? You'd have a problem on your hand, right? It's the same way uh, in our bodies. It's the same way in the church. It's the same way for each of us personally. There has to come a time of recalibration. And I believe what God is doing is he's recalibrating us. He's recalibrating our focus. He's recalibrating our hearts. If I could give you a word to, to launch you into this new year, it would simply be this, focus. Don't be distracted when God is breaking you through. Focus. Don't be distracted by the past when God's bringing you into a new beginning. Focus. Don't, don't focus on what is or what isn't. Focus on who he is and where he's bringing you. Something very significant happened in the book of Joshua in chapter 3. The Lord gives Joshua the command, get the, get the people ready, get the elders together. Uh, it's time to cross over from the wilderness in the promised land. And in that moment, he gives this instruction. He tells the people, listen, we're going in. 
And he gives everybody this instruction, keep your eyes on the ark or keep your eyes on the presence of God because we've never been this way before. Can I tell you something? This is a season to focus on his presence. His presence will deliver you from the past. His, his presence will bring you in to that place filled with a hope and a future. Jeremiah 29 and 11 says, For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord, uh, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. I believe right now that this is a season of stepping in to hope. There is a healing of hope in this room this morning. Some of you feel like you, you, your hope has been deflated. Some of you feel like faith has failed. Some of you have, fe have, have felt like you have been in the midst of trial or famine or struggle. But I'm here to tell you that hope is being healed this morning. Yep. He is a healer of hope. In Romans chapter 5 verse 15, it says these words. It says, hope does not disappoint. God is bringing us into hope. Here's why. Hope is the substance of faith. Yeah. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Right? Can, can I tell you something? God is about to restore your hope so that he can renew your faith. Yeah. And some of us are in this place, in this moment in God, where you, you are living in a Proverbs 13, 12 moment. It says, the, it says this in the Bible, that hope deferred makes the heart sick. But a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. And some of you right now are going from, from hope deferred to God preferred. You're going from that place uh, of where it feels like your hope has been deferred into the place of a longing fulfilled. I'm not just saying nice things to you this morning. I'm prophesying to you today that 2019 is going to be a year uh, uh, where God is about to establish uh, a tree of life. He, he is about to establish a tree of life in this place. Hope deferred has made the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. God is about to fulfill the longings or the desires of your heart. What does that mean? The Bible says in Proverbs uh, and in Psalm 103 that if you, uh, that if you uh, delight in the Lord, he will give to you the desires of your heart. And God is bringing you into a place of delighting in what God has done. Are you hearing me? How many know that, that he is a redeemer of time? I believe that this is going to be a year of redemption. God is redeeming time. He's redeeming things that you thought were long gone. There's a, a man in our church uh, in Pensacola, Brother Reggie Benjamin. And uh, Reggie is a chaplain for Escambia County, Florida uh, jails. And he uh, is over our prison and, and jail ministry. And uh, a few years ago, he walked through a very difficult time and, and, and season in his life. And he was affected by the, the market crash and the housing crash of uh, 2007, 2008. And they came and they foreclosed on his house. Him and his wife uh, moved, uh, moved out of the house. They, they, they gave it up and they kind of just moved on and were in rentals. And all of a sudden, uh, a year and a half ago, his lawyer called him up and said, you know what, the, the bank never executed, uh, never executed um, the, the foreclosure. And by law, that house now belongs to you. Go move back into it. And he moved back into it debt free. Now I'm not telling you not to pay your mortgage. <laughs> Are you hearing me? What I'm saying is something got stolen from him and God didn't just redeem it the way he left it. He redeemed it for him paid in full. And I'm here to tell you right now that God is not a God of partiality. He's not a partial God. He, he is a whole God. And here's what I want you to hear this morning is God's not coming here as I want him to be. He's coming as he really is. I have the parts of God that I'm more comfortable with. Would you agree with that? I'm really comfortable with Jesus, the babe in the manger. That's kind of, because he's kind of controllable to me. But what will we do with a God who's out of control? He's kind, he's merciful, but he's also mighty. He, he's merciful, but, he, but he's also holy. The babe in the manger is also the soon coming king. Aren't you glad for that? And he's not coming as I want him to be. He's not coming with a piece of him. He's coming with all of him. 
I said earlier to you that one of the things that marks this house, moments that I go back to in, in my memory banks for the last seven years are moments in the presence of God. There were some that were happening this morning. Dave kind of took us on a journey. There were new songs and Lainey did the rap in the middle of that one song and it was amazing and I couldn't keep up with her uh, and uh, I'm too wide. I have too, much, too little rhythm, right? But, but I was enjoying it and then all of a sudden we went into, uh, we went into uh, Heart of Worship from you know, maybe 15 years ago and uh, You're All I Want, You're All I Ever Needed. And you're all I want, you're all I ever needed. It took me back 22 years to the, day, to the day I got saved. It was one of the first worship songs I ever heard. And it hit me this morning like it hit me then. And the cry of my heart for, Lord, you're all I want, you're all I need, you're all I ever needed, was stronger today, was more today than it's, than it's ever been. Why? There, there was a moment in God connected to it. But how many know the presence of God isn't a goose bump? It's, it's not somebody just falling on the floor. It's, it's not just speaking in tongues. But the presence of God is not a thing. The presence of God is a person. His name is Jesus. And I believe in this place this morning, the presence of God is here, meaning that Jesus is here, not a part of him, not a piece of him, not an idea, de, not an idea of him, not an ideology of him, not a theology of him, not a perception of him, not a philosophy of him. But Jesus is in this room today. Jesus, the full grown Jesus, the, the, the resurrected one, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the healer, the restorer, the, the deliverer. He, he is in this room this morning as he really is. Here's how I know I brought him with me. You, you brought him with you. When you were born again, you didn't get a little baby Jesus in a manger. You didn't get a toddler Jesus. You didn't get a teenage Jesus. But you got a full-grown, resurrected, filled with power from on high, Jesus Christ, who took up residency on the inside of you. He put his hands inside of your hands, his feet inside of your feet. He gave you the mind of Christ, the heart of God, and he anointed you to be a mouthpiece, an oracle of God in the earth. It's powerful. The God who spoke everything into existence is living on the inside of you and me. And I guarantee you, he wants one thing. He wants out. He, he wants to come out of us. He wants to pour out of us that hope and that glory that we carry. He wants it to spill out in the restaurant, in the school, and in the marketplace, and on the, on the job site. He, he wants it to, to follow us down the street. He, he wants that to be the calling card of God on our life. Aren't you glad? I believe that you're stepping into a season like you've never known before. I believe the Lord has called you and he's releasing an anointing upon each of us this morning that, it, that is going to terrify hell itself. Are you hearing me? Yeah. Here's what I believe. God is releasing a prophetic anointing upon this house to destroy the isms. Yeah. Yes. To destroy the isms. All over the world today, there's isms. There's denominationalism that, that separates and divides the body of Christ. That there's sexism that tries to hold women down and, and keep them from fulfilling the fullness of the call of God on their life. There's racism, there's sexism, there's, there's all of those things. And the anointing to defeat those things uh, is, is upon us today. Aren't you glad? Come on, the anointing to tear down the ism so that we build something that looks like Jesus, that smells like him, that carries the fragrance uh, of his presence, that, that, that releases the fullness uh, of his heart in the earth. I, I believe that's a powerful thing. Do you receive that today? Come on, I, I believe right now the Lord is releasing the anointing of confrontation upon us. Here's why. What you don't confront becomes your culture. If you don't, come, become, if you don't confront fear, Fear becomes your culture. And I'm telling you right now that the Lord is releasing an anointing to confront those things that have tried to control us, stop us, hold us back. And when you confront it, the enemy tries to leave. We will have to flee. A couple of years ago, many years ago, uh, I was set free in June, uh, January 17th, 1997 from alcoholism and, and, and drug addiction and, uh, and, and schizophrenia and mental illness, depression, suicide, all of those things. And, and God just gave me a, a, a completely, a, a complete change. How many know he doesn't change you partially, he changes you in full. Uh, and, and he just completely changed my mind. I, I, I was crazy, but I, I, and I tried committing suicide, but I woke up in my sound mind. It was, you know, the Lord just completely did a work overnight. Uh, and, and I gave my life to him. And, and that scripture uh, of 1 Corinthians 5 and 17 came alive. That if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. A species of being that's never existed before. 
Can, can I tell you something? He didn't modify my behavior. He changed my life. And the church doesn't exist to modify behavior. We exist to preach a Jesus who will change your life. Not to remind you of your past, but to, to, to point you to that hope and a future, to bring you in to the present, to bring you into that place where everything changes. Are you hearing me? Here's what I believe. God never focuses on what's wrong. He focuses on what's missing. And the problem with m most of the church today is this. Immediately, we move to rumors of what's wrong. Did you hear this? Did you hear this? This is wrong. This is wrong. Something must be wrong here. Something must be wrong here. And the fact of the matter is, it's probably nothing wrong. It's something missing. Let me just say this to you in all love. I don't think we have a right to say something's wrong until we have the answer and provide what's missing. I don't have a right to tell you what's wrong with you unless I can give you the peace inside of your life that's missing in you. Are you hearing me today? God didn't focus on what was wrong with me. I was overcome by fear and what was missing in my life was love. But he gave me that perfect love that was missing that cast out all fear. Are you hearing me? And when he did that, I'll never forget... I was walking with him for about six months, six months into it. People misunderstood me. I, you know, they were just waiting for me. They thought I was on a Jesus kick and I was going to get over it and all of those things and go back to the old style and the old life and all of those things. But he completely transformed my life. And, and I'll never forget, I was walking with him and uh, he asked me one day, just out of the blue, Jesus just said, yeah, you want to see a demon? I said, no, I got rid of a bunch of those. I don't ever want to see one again. And he showed me one anyway. And it was this little cockroach looking thing that was just in a, in, casting this huge shadow. And he asked me this question, why are you afraid of what's under your feet? Why are you afraid of what's under your feet? Can I tell you something? You don't really have to fight, you just need to step. Every time I step towards God, the enemy distanced himself. Are you hearing me? I wonder what would happen if the church became God-focused instead of sin-focused. Can I just be real and raw with you? It is really hard for me to cuss while I'm speaking in tongues. I'm not focusing on not cussing. I'm just focusing on communicating with God. It's really hard to look at pornography when I'm worshiping Jesus. Because I've never seen anything so beautiful, never experienced anything so intimate as him. It's not me not focusing, it's not me focusing on not watching pornography. It's me focusing on Jesus who is so beautiful. He's my everything. And I don't want to compromise this. I don't want to miss this because something distracts me. I, I want to keep my gaze upon him. If I, were to, if, if I could tell you one thing that would be the greatest gift you would give to Jesus this year, it would be this, that you would choose every day of 2019 to fall in love with him all over again. Yeah. Yeah. To fall in love with him all over again. Here's what I believe. If you don't stay spiritually hungry, you'll fill it with something else. Yeah. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled. Something happens. He fills me. Every time I'm hungry and thirsty for him, he fills me. But if I get distracted, I'll have to find something else to fill those holes. And I'm telling you right now, if you will focus your gaze, if this will be a year of focus, God will, God will absolutely saturate you. He will fill you to a place of overflowing and abounding in love. Here's what I believe. We are stepping into a season that I believe this next year is going to be a year uh, that's going to be filled with freedom. How many know freedom is good? Yeah. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. It's not a partial work. It means that every chain is broken. How many know he took the crown of thorns upon his head for your sound mind? Isn't that good? He, he broke the chains of sickness and, and addiction by, by, the, uh, by, by the stripes he took upon his back. Isn't that amazing? I don't want to settle for anything less than what Jesus paid for at the cross. 
He is fully determined that you would have everything that he paid for in the year ahead. I believe right now that this is going to be a year of freedom. If you will receive this word today, I will tell you that you will look back a year from now and you won't recognize the person sitting in the chair today. You won't recognize what you were. You won't, it'll be so far removed. I run into people all the time that, that they want to remind me of how I was in 1989 when I graduated high school and how crazy I was in 1993 and how I was in 1997. I, I see pictures of me holding bottles and doing all kinds of, of crazy things. But to me, that is so far removed from who I am. It's like, I know that guy, but I don't remember that guy. Yeah. I don't recognize him because that, that door has been completely shut. Why? He, he didn't cause me, he didn't just cause me to change my behavior. He actually changed my entire destiny and identity to be focused on him. He, he filled everything that was missing in my life. He, he, he healed everything that was broken in my life. I like what brother Rob said. He said, for me, it's been a process and some of us are in process, but the process always leads us somewhere. Some of you are feeling this morning that 2018 was a year of fire. Anybody feel like you went through fire? Can I tell you something? Fire has a purpose, right? The refiner's fire comes. I don't even want to give the enemy credit that I walked through the, the attacks of the enemy. No, I, I've just been walking through refiner's fire. I've come out where the Lord has been purifying and work, working on the inside of me and strengthening me and, and bringing glory, uh, bringing his glory and refreshing me. It's a powerful thing. It is going to be a year of freedom. Amen. Can I tell, what if I told you that you're going to get so free, you don't even have a choice in it. it you're going to be so free. You're going to be so free. Secondly, I believe it's going to be a year of justice. A year of justice. I love the justice of God. Anybody else love the justice of God? Listen to this. I love... These words in, in the Psalms, Psalm 89 and 14 says, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before your face. I believe that's going to be a key scripture for the year ahead. Listen, we live in a world and we live in, in, in churchianity that, that the word is this judgment. Every hurricane that comes, every earthquake that comes, every tsunami that comes, every disaster that comes, every attack that comes, it's the judgment of God. And those people have no idea of the goodness of God. That's right. Can I tell you something? We live in a fallen world and stuff happens. But not everything that happens is the judgment of God. Here's why. I believe the word for this season is justice. He loves justice. Here's what I'm talking about. If you are sick in your body, how many know that's an injustice? So the justice for sickness is healing. If you're broken your emotions, that's an injustice. The justice of God is the joy of the Lord is your strength. It, the injustice is you're in poverty, you're, you're poor, you're, you're, you're broke, you, you, there, there's nothing left. But the justice is that he is your provider, he is your sustainer, he is your portion. He causes your cup to run over. Are you hearing me? And I'm telling you right now that we must be a church that cries out for the justice of God. Because the justice of God will, will, will keep you from the judgments of man. I will tell you this any day. I'd rather stand and be judged by God than judged by this world. Are you hearing me? I'm telling you right now that God is bringing us into a season of justice. Justice and mercy are the foundation of his throne. In other words, it's at the very core of who he is. He rules with justice and righteousness. He, he rules with, with mercy and truth. Those things are, are coming together. They're surrounding us in, in the year ahead. Aren't you glad for that? Come on, I believe that today that the spirit of the Lord is about, is about to pour out on us in a new and a, in a powerful way. I believe that many of us have gone through a season of testing. For 2018, a year of testing, relationships tested, uh, churches tested, finances tested, marriages tested, all of those things. It's been a year of testing. But God is bringing us from testing into a season of testimony. Aren't you glad? Uh, I love 
Uh, I love this story in the book of, of Matthew uh, chapter 3. Jesus is, is, sees John the Baptist baptizing people in the Jordan River. Remember that story? And he, he goes up to John the Baptist and, and he said, it's my turn. And John says, I'm, uh, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I'm not even worthy to un untie your shoes. And Jesus convinces him. He said, you have to do this, John, so that all of righteousness can be fulfilled. And John reluctantly does it, but he obeys. And Jesus goes down into the Jordan and comes up. And as he comes up out of the water, the heavens open. Holy Spirit defend, uh, descends in the, in the form of a dove. How many know the Holy Spirit's not a bird? Right? He's a person. He descends in the form of a dove. Right? The Bible says that the Spirit alighted upon him. And suddenly the voice of his Father, the voice of heaven said, Behold, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He didn't whisper it on the inside, but he announced it so that everybody around him could hear. If we were to baptize you today and the heavens opened, a dove came down and the voice of God said, behold, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. How many know you might get a goose bump? Right? You, you may be on a spiritual high. You may be like, whoa, I, I am the called of God. I'm about to conquer everything in the next 30 days. It's going to be amazing. And all of those things, right? Powerful. But what happens, the very next chapter, you'd go into Matthew chapter four and it says immediately, immediately after the spirit of the Lord led him into the desert or into the wilderness to be tempted or tested by the enemy. Now, wait a minute. I thought the presence of God only took me to Southwest Florida and white sand beaches. I thought he only brought me to places that were great and nice and people loved each other and hugged each other every Sunday and really meant it. And like, I love you and you love me. And like a Barney prophecy, you know? <laughs> I love you, you love me. Another Barney prophecy with a great big hug and a kiss from me to you. <laughs> I guess Barney's outdated now, but, but it still works, right? Uh, and most of us feel like this, that when we come to Jesus, everything is gonna be all right. But how, how many know that when you come to Jesus, it's gonna be tested? And the Spirit of God takes him out to, to be tempted and tested by the enemy. And he fasts 40 days and 40 nights. How many know he's doing the right thing? He's doing a hard thing, but he's doing the right thing. Have you ever said yes and then got into a mess? Yeah. Yep. Have you ever stepped out into obedience with God and then have all hell break loose? Have you ever had this moment of God that everything changes and a prophetic word comes about you're about to do X, Y, and Z and all of these amazing things are going to happen and the exact opposite happens? Yeah. Have you ever been in a place where you thought, wow, I'm on top of the world, I'm his favorite, I'm his chosen, and the next day the attacks come? It's what happens to Jesus. I say it like this, if it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. And he's out there and I believe that most of us are going through the testings. And the first place that the enemy comes to test Jesus is simply this. He said, hey man, you've been out here for 30 days or 40 days and 40 nights. You've been fasting and, and he's saying, he says these words. If you really are the son of God, command these stones to turn into bread. Eat man, you're hungry. The first test you'll ever face, I guarantee that all of us are facing it, have faced it or are about to face it, is the test of identity. Who are you? Do you know who you really are? The greatest crime in the world today, in the earth today, is identity theft. Here's what identity theft is, especially if you're a believer. Somebody steals you from you. I'm going to let that sink in for a second. Somebody steals you from you. I'm telling you right now, when everything gets redeemed, are you hearing me? The redemption of who you are and who, cre who, he, who he created you to be is about, is about to fall upon you today. If you really are the son of God, turn these stones into bread and eat. And Jesus responded in a very cool way. Man shall not live, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Some of the greatest lessons I've ever learned, I've learned from my children. 
They've given me lots of sermon material over the last 20 years or so. And um, I grew up without a dad, and so sometimes uh, I've just wung it. You ever wing it? You really don't, never seen it done before, so you wing it, and sometimes you make mistakes. And I just started out in ministry in about 2003 and was traveling, uh, just stepped into full-time traveling ministry. And I'd gone on a trip to, to New England up into Connecticut. Uh, and when I got to Atlanta, all the flights to JFK and Hartford and all of Connecticut, the eastern seaboard, uh, were canceled because there, uh, there was a nor'easter. So I got stuck in Atlanta, which and if I would have thought about it, I would have just rented a car and drove four hours. But instead, I waited about 12 hours in Atlanta, finally got home about two in the morning. Uh, and uh, I went to bed, fell asleep. It was about a week before Christmas time. My, my wife um, woke up about 6 a.m. and she had a need. Ladies, you can appreciate this need. She had the need to go shopping. Uh, she said, uh, I need to go finish Christmas shopping. And I said, great, take the kids with you. I'm tired. She said, no, you don't understand. I, I prayed that the Lord would send you home early. And he answered even quicker than I thought. Uh, and so you're going to keep the kids. And so being the man of my house, the king of my castle, the ruler of my roost, uh, I said, yes, dear. Um, because if mom ain't happy, nobody's going to be happy. Uh, and so she went out shopping. Me and the boys cut a little bit. I made them pancakes and eggs for breakfast. I just cleaned it up. My cell phone rang. Somebody was in crisis. Their crisis became my emergency. I wanted to be a good minister, but also a good dad. So I put my five-year-old daughter in charge of my three-year-old son and one-and-a-half-year-old son. Uh, and I said, if they get in any trouble, you just come and get me. I'll come out. I went into my room, I prayed, I don't know what happened, heavens opened, people were lifted up into the glory clouds, and I, no, I don't know what happened, I'm sure it was good. Uh, I came out of my room after about 10 or 15 minutes, uh, into the living room, everything was all right, but then I turned into uh, the, the kitchen, and then I saw it. Uh, and it is the only way to describe what I saw. My sons had gotten in the refrigerator, got into 18 raw eggs, smashed them all over the cabinets, the cupboards, the floors, all over themselves. And they didn't end there. They got into uh, Hershey's chocolate powder. So I had an ooey, gooey, eggy, chocolatey mess smeared everywhere. Uh, and two emotions hit me. The first emotion was fear because mama was coming home. The, the second emotion was anger because I was going to have to clean it up. Uh, and so I blew it. I blew it as a Christian. I blew it as a, a preacher. I blew it as a dad. And I did what teachers and other people had asked me my whole life. I just exploded on this three-year-old boy. I got down on his level in an intimidating way. And I said, who do you think you are? And he looked up at me with big brown eyes like I was stupid. And he said, dad, I Benjamin. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit spoke to me in that moment. He knows more at three than you know at 33. He knows who he is and he knows who his father is. And if you will know those two things, it will, it will be the key for everything you need in life. Are, are you hearing me today? It was one of the greatest moments of revelation in my life from a three-year-old. So when do we stop growing up and start growing down? Who told you not to be childlike anymore? There's a childlikeness coming back. There's a difference between being childlike and childish. Here's childlike. I have five kids. None of my kids have ever asked me, hey, dad, do you have enough money for the power bill this month? Do you have enough for the mortgage payment, my tuition payment? You have enough to go out grocery shopping. You have enough for Christmas presents. They, they've never once asked me about that. Here's why. It's not their job. They trust me for everything. Because I'm their dad. And my job as their dad is to protect them and provide for them. It's not their job. And somehow in the church, we, we start out believing that. And we move to this place where I have to, I have to, I have to, I have to. And we, we stop trusting and we start striving. And I'm telling you right now, the Lord is setting you free today from striving. Listen, something happens when you know who you are. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 19, or 17, verse 19, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he's asking them a question. They're sitting around a fire. They're, they're talking. They're having an intimate moment. And he said, hey, who does everybody say that I am? 
Some say you're Jeremiah. Some say you're a prophet. Some say you're a teacher. Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're this. Some say you're that. Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? And Peter gets one right. So glad for Peter. He gets one right. Ooh, ooh, pick me, pick me. I, I know this one. He said, I know that you are the Christ. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but this has been revealed to you by my father in heaven. And today you're no longer Simon, but you're Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What happened? When Peter got a revelation of who Jesus was, he got a revelation of who he was. He went from Simon, which means small pebble, to Peter, which means rock. He went from something small and insignificant to something great with one revelation. And I'm here to tell you right now, when you get the revelation of who God is and you get the revelation of who you are, everything changes. Everything changes. And I'm telling you right now that in this place, there is an awakening of who he is and who you are. The greatest gift you can know this year going into the next year is simply this, knowing who you are and whose you are. And if you'll know those two things, man, everything else falls in place. Here's why. The world wants to know if you know who you are. Romans 8 says, all of creation is longing, even with eager expectation under now, waiting for the revelation of the manifestation of the sons of God. All the world is looking for you to reveal Jesus. All of the world is looking for you to become that revelation of who God is. Why? Because you're carrying the answer to every one of their struggles. Do you know that we're the answer people? The answer to every world crisis struggle is in this room today. His name is Jesus. He is the Prince of Peace. He is the Almighty God. He is the Everlasting Father. He is the Father to the fatherless. He is the faithful one, even in the midst of a faithless world. He, he remains faithful. He remains true. He, he remains glorious and powerful and almighty and all of those things. And when you begin to reveal the Christ in you, the hope of glory, everything in the world around us changes. You know what's happening in Russia, North Korea, happening all over the earth? Birth pains. Just birth pains. The birth pains, it's just everything is acting up, waiting for you to manifest who you are. Yeah. Secondly, the enemy wants to know who you are because if you know who you are, he leaves you alone. I believe there's one name that the enemy fears more than the name of Jesus. It's his own name. Because he knows when every believer says Satan or devil, he knows the next thing is, in the name of Jesus, get out of here. And when you know that you're a child of God and you have the power and the backing of the name and the power of Jesus, everything changes around your life. Are you hearing me? Yeah. The world is longing. The, and, and thirdly, this, God wants to know if you know who you are. Because if you never know who you are, you'll never know the inheritance that belongs to you. Right. I'm telling you right now, identity and intimacy and inheritance is coming to this house and this body in the next year like, like never before. There's great testings, that identity test. The second test is what I would call a validity test. If you really are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. It said that the angels are given charge over you and you can't even dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said, it is written, you shouldn't put the Lord your God to the test and the enemy leaves again. What was he trying to do? Prove yourself. He was trying to move him from identity to performance. Can I tell you something? God isn't looking at your performance. We're called, we're, we're a spirit-filled church. Would you agree with that? People filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of God flowing in the room. One term for that is charismatic. It, it gets a bad rap. Most people think charismatic is somebody with a bubbly personality. But the truth is this, if you understand the word charismatic, it comes from the Greek charismata. And it really is translated literally this, gifts of God's love and gifts of God's grace. How many know you don't earn a gift, you receive a gift? Yeah. So the gift of prophecy in my life, the gifts of healing in my life, the gift of ministry on my life is not a reward for good behavior. It's actually a sign of relationship with God. Are you hearing me? It sets me free from performance and keeps me flowing in love. Can I tell you something? Love with an agenda doesn't flow. If I love you because that doesn't flow. 
I don't love you for what you can do for me. I don't love you because uh, of your position you hold. I don't love you for what, uh, how that might benefit me. I love you unconditionally. I love you because God loves you and gave himself for you. How many know that flows? And that kind of river is going to begin to flow through this community, through this body, in this season like, like never before. It's not, I'm not validated by my performance. He loves me whether I preach good or preach bad this morning. He just loves me. Why? I'm his son. And the third test is this. It is the test of integrity. Again, the enemy comes to him in Matthew chapter 4 said, hey, Jesus, come here. Let me, let me just show you something. See all the kingdoms of this world. See all of this stuff, all of the gold, all of the riches, all of the power, all of those things. See all of that? Look, nobody else is around. Just me and you here, bud. If you'll just bow down, nobody will have to know. Just bow down and worship me and I'll give you all of this. Sometimes I feel bad for the devil. He's so stupid, right? He tests Jesus with what already belonged to him. He was there when it was all created. And he tests him, if you, if you want this, I'll give it to you right now. It all begins with, hey, nobody else is looking, just me and you here. Integrity is really doing the right thing when you can do the wrong thing and not get caught. And I'm telling you right now, God is bringing such integrity to the body of Christ, such integrity to the ministry, such integrity uh, again to the, to the church. Why? Because the world is watching. The, the world is watching. Can I tell you something? Some of you might have been going through that refining because God has been purifying your container. Can I tell you something? Your character is greater than your calling. And your calling will only be as great as your character. I'm not talking about behavior. I'm talking about at the core of who you are. It's being Christ-like. Isn't that amazing? He, he wants me to be like him. That, that's the whole purpose of him coming. That every day I could be more and more like him. Come on, I believe that's falling in the room today. Here, here's where I want to close. I believe we're in a season uh, that, that God is bringing us into where he's defeating every distraction. Are you hearing me today? I love the story of David and Goliath in 1 Samuel chapter 16. David is bringing his brothers out lunch. Remember the story? Jesse sends David out to find his brothers in battle. He says, bring him some lunch, get some favor with him. He's going out there and he arrives on the battlefield and he finds the army of Israel, the most mighty army in the world at its time and even still today, I believe. And, and they are in this place of hiding and cowering. And there is a, a giant named Goliath, a Philistine on top of the mountain. And he's just shouting at them. You are nothings. You are nobody. God has forsaken you. You are worms. You are weasels. You are dogs. I'm going to come down there. We're coming down there pretty soon. We're going to take your heads off. We're going to bring your children to slavery. We're going to wipe you out. You're nothing. You're nobodies. You're dogs. And they listened to it day in and day out. Two and three times a day, the giant would come out and remind them of everything they weren't. And they actually started believing it. They went from confident, we can conquer everything, the Lord is on our side, to we are nobodies, we are nobodies, the Lord has forsaken us. Just a matter of time. And David shows up and he said, hey, what's going on here? Who, who are you? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he would defy and defile the army of God, the children of God? Everybody's saying, David, shh, you're going to get yourself and us killed. You don't know what you're talking about. You just brought lunch. You just, you, you just came, you're a nobody, you're a sh little shepherd boy. Who are you? He said, I can take him down. And they go to put armor on him, but Saul's armor doesn't fit. How many know God isn't dressing you up like everybody else? There is an assignment. There is an anointing. There, there is an equipping. God wants to equip you because if you get equipped, you won't get whipped. There is armor that fits you. There is a helmet of salvation that fits you. There is a breastplate of righteousness that fits you. There, there is a belt of truth that fits you. There are shoes of peace that fit you. There, there is a sword of the spirit. There, there is a shield of faith that fits you. It was designed for you and what you would walk through and what you would go through in life. And I'm telling you right now, the season of the imitation and trying to be like everybody else is coming to an end. That, that if you'll get a revelation of the identity, if you'll get a revelation of all of it, come on, if you'll get a revelation of all of that, everything changes. I've been waiting for that. 
Come on, there's something that happens when you step into your own skin, when you step into your own calling, when you step into your own identity and the purposes of God. And they were saying, well, well, well David, you're, you're just a little shepherd boy. And all of a sudden he went somewhere. He went somewhere in his spiritual memory bank. He went back to the place of the last testimony. He went back to that place where the last time he saw God do a miracle where God showed up. And he said, you know what? One time I was watching my father's sheep and a lion showed up and he was stalking the sheep. So I started stalking him. And I killed that lion with my own bare hands. I got his head mounted in my tent. I said, well, David, that was maybe a one in time thing. He said, no, another time a bear came and he was stalking the sheep and I started stalking him. And I wrestled that bear and now I've got a nice bear head on my, on my wall and I got a nice bear skin rug. He said, so I reckon that I got a lion and a bear, so a giant, he ain't nothing. And all of a sudden he began to remind himself. I love what the Bible says in the Psalms. It says that David was greatly distressed. The Bible says in, in, in 1 Samuel that David was greatly distressed because all of the people had turned on him and were ready to stone him because they were fearful for his life. And da the Bible says, and, but David encouraged himself in the Lord. And I'm telling you right now that this is a season to learn how to encourage yourself. It, it, it's coming in a place on Monday morning. I am a child of God. I have been called. I have been chosen. I have a destiny. His goodness and his faithfulness surround me. They go before me. Goodness and mercy are following me. I, I fear no evil because God is with me. My cup, it overflows. See, I believe Goliath's greatest weapon wasn't his sword or his size. It was discouragement. And I'm telling you right now, God is breaking off that devil of discouragement off your life. Amen. You're not going to go out of this year discouraged. You're, you're going to go out rejoicing. You're going to go out of this year encouraged and empowered, realizing the Lord is on my side. Who will I fear? The Lord God is for me. Of who will I be afraid? You know, there's something that happens when your mindset changes, when your focus is not on who you're not, but your focus on who you are and who God is in your life. Some of you right now, you need to go back to the place and you need to remember where he found you and the pit that he found you in and the trouble and the struggle that he found you in and how he brought you out of all of that to bring you into a place of being renewed and being restored and being full of his spirit and his power and love. You, you need to go back to that place when, when you were a nothing and a nobody or when you were an addict and you were tormented, but all of a sudden he set you free in a moment. See, I believe he used his testimony. To, he used his testimony to become his prophecy. I'm telling you right now, when you remember what God did in your past, it begins to, begins to focus you. If he did that then, he's about to do greater things in my future. I've got a word for you today. That the greater days, the latter days are going to be greater than the former days. That the greater days of this house, the greater days of Pastor Dan's ministry, the greatest days of your life and my life, the greatest days of this church, the greatest days of the kingdom of God are not behind us somewhere. They are not a memory, but they are a prophecy. They are pointing me forward. They are bringing me to the place of there is a hope, there is a future, there is a calling that if he said it, he's going to do it. Because even when I'm faithless, he's faithful. Even when I'm quitting, he's still winning. Even when it feels like every Everything is over for me. He's saying new beginning. And I'm telling you right now that we are stepping into a new season of new beginnings. We are stepping into a new season of abundance. We are stepping into a new season of faith, hope, and love. We are stepping into a season of seeing the salvation of our God. Two or three years ago, I was sitting in my living room on, on New Year's Eve spending time with God. I, I write every year. I, I just hear what God is saying. I, I take the majority of, of New Year's Eve and I just sit with the Lord and I, I write out a word for the, for the year, for the body. And I was sitting with him and I'd finished that word. And the Lord said, I, I want you to dream with me. I want you to, to write everything you're believing me to do. And I filled up a whole notebook. I closed it. I felt really accomplished and said, in the name of Jesus, amen. And he said, is that it? Because I can do more. I mean, if that's it, so I got three more notebooks. I wrote, I began to just, I just began to write it down Amen. began to dream with God. And I watched him through that year, just do it. But in that moment, as I finished that, uh, that, that notebook, uh, I began to be overwhelmed by all of it. I began to think of Lord, how am I going to provide for that? How am I going to do this? How am I going to time all of that stuff? And I became so overwhelmed. I just did something very odd for a preacher. I just cried out, 
Jesus, save me. Jesus, save me. Jesus, save me. At the same time, I'm questioning, why am I saying that and praying that I'm already saved? I'm a preacher for crying out loud. And the Lord said, I'm not only able to save your soul, I'm able to save your circumstance, your situation, your finances, your family, your marriage. I, I, I'm able to save all of it. Can I tell you something? He is the Savior of all. And I feel Jesus the Savior in the room this morning. I don't know what you need saving. I don't know what needs to be redeemed. I, I don't know in your life what circumstance, what situation, what, what thing you're walking through. But he knows. And I feel Jesus the Savior walking in this room. And I'm telling you, I felt it this morning and I, uh, earlier in the first service. And I feel it this morning as we end. I feel the angel of mercy in the room today. Mercy is powerful. Mercy is powerful. Mercy doesn't just bring me out of something. It brings me into something. Mercy isn't just the end of an old way. It's the beginning of something new. See, it's not in the nature of God to bring me out without bringing me in. Are you hearing me? I believe this morning that God is about to move in this place. Over these last few hours of 2018, he's about to move in your life. He's about to move in your family. I believe there's about to be some, uh, some 12th hour, 11th hour surprises. I believe there's some things that God is about to finish. Can I tell you something? It doesn't matter how you started this year. It's how you finish that counts. You, you may have started out crazy, but you're, you're, in, you're ending in the presence of God. You, you may have seemed like, oh, I'm way out here. But today, God's brought you into a new place. And I'm telling you right now, new is now. There's something new happening right now in, in our lives and in our midst. Are you hearing me this morning? Today, maybe you're here. Maybe you're visiting. Maybe you, you've been coming for a long time. Jesus, the Savior, is here. I didn't just give you some nice talks, some, some religious points and principles this morning. I preach the full gospel of Jesus Christ. Can I tell you something? Jesus is good news. Jesus himself is good news. If you want a prophecy for the new year, you're good news. You should be a banner, a billboard for the goodness of God. When people look at your life, they should say, man, when I look at him, God's good. When I look at her, I see the goodness of God. When I believe the good news and the goodness of God are in the room. It's not the judgment of God or the fear of God that brings me to repentance. It is the kindness of God. Can I tell you something? The kindness of God is here. I believe the kindness of God is drawing some people in this room to his, to his heart. Maybe you're here today. I didn't just give you some nice talk, religious principles. Uh, I preached a message about a person. His name is Jesus. He's in this room. You might think, well, that was nice and moving and all of that stuff. I didn't come here to motivate you. Uh, I know that every time this word is preached, it's performed. He watches over his word day and night and he's careful to perform it. And maybe you're here today and you say, well, I heard the words, but I, more than hearing the words, I feel something in my heart today. I feel a tug in my heart. I'll tell you what that is. It's the presence of God. It's the Holy Spirit drawing you, wanting to connect you to the God who created you. Romans says something pretty sad. It says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's bad news. It means this, we all deserve to die and go to hell. But the good news is this, while we were yet sinners, when we were the enemies of God, he loved us and came and he gave himself for us. He died for us. Man, that's radical love. The Bible says there's no other name under heaven or earth in the book of Acts by which a man can be saved other than the name of Jesus. The book of Acts also says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. Today, can I tell you something? Jesus isn't a Bible story. He's not a religion. He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords, but he's also the lover of your soul. The only thing he wants from you is you. The only thing he wants from you is you. The beautiful thing about Jesus is you come as you are. I can't change you. My greatest sermon can't change you. The greatest anointing on my life can't change you. Only he can change you. But when he changes you, I'm telling you, you'll know it. Everything changes. Everything gets transformed. Maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus. You've never made him the Lord and Savior of your life. 
not asking you if you've gone to church, not asking you if you've made communion, not asking you if you've been baptized. I'm asking you this one question, do you know Jesus? If you know him, it'll change your life forever. Or maybe you're here today and you say, you want, I used to be walking, I was walking with God and I've walked away, I've turned my back, I've got disappointed, distracted and I need to get right, I need to give my life to Jesus. This morning I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. If you're in this room, you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or you say, Dave, I'm, just, I'm going to be honest, I've been away from God, I need to give my life back to Him today. I don't want to embarrass you, I just want to pray for you. If you want me to include you in that prayer, Dave, pray for me. I need to get right with God, I need to give my life to Jesus today. I'm not going to embarrass you, I just want to pray for you. If you want me to include you in that prayer, I just want you to lift your hand, you put it right back down. See your hands, see your hands, see your hands. All over the back, see your hands. See your hand in the middle, see your hand over there, thank you. See your hand there, see your hand there, ladies. See your hand in the back there, sir. See your hand there, man, thanks. See your hand there, bro, thanks. Jesus, it never gets old. Moments like these, God, never get old to me. Moments like these remind me why we do what we do, why we exist as the church, why we are who we are, why I fly ridiculous miles and I'm gone ridiculous amounts of days. Moments like this are so worth it because Jesus, you're so worthy. Jesus, I can't save anybody. Only you are the Savior of the world. You're the only one who died for us. Or you're the only author who wrote a book out of love for its reader. Lord, I thank you right now for the privilege of the gospel. That's good news. If you've just raised your hand, whether it's the first time or the hundredth time, and you meant it, I, I need to get right with God. I need to give my life to Jesus. I'm going to keep my word. I don't want to embarrass you. I do want to pray for you. To make it easier, I'm going to ask you to do something. If you raise your hand, just get out of your seat. Just stand across the front with me. We're going to pray a prayer together. And I believe God's going to come and fill your life. Something in you is going to change. He's a God you can feel. He's a God who speaks to us and talks to us and loves us. There's no shame. There's no condemnation in this message. He's an amazing God of grace. He's an amazing God of grace and mercy and love and and hope. Lord, I thank you. Maybe for us, some of us today, you've been what's missing. Today we receive your love. My friends, to be honest with you, I've seen many miracles. I've seen three people raised from the dead. I've seen a limb grow out. I've seen deaf ears hearing. I've seen blind eyes open. I've seen the lame walk. I've seen the miracles of the Bible and in my life over the last few years. But you'll never see a greater miracle than what you're witnessing this morning. Are you hearing me? The greatest miracle of all. See, right now, as these have come, the Bible says all of heaven celebrates, rejoices. I like to picture it like this, that these people are responsible for a party being thrown in heaven tonight. All of the angels are rejoicing, all of the saints, all of the cloud of witnesses, Jesus himself is celebrating this moment. And so, Father, I thank you right now for everyone that's come today. If you've come forward, I want you to lift your hands. It's a sign of surrender. Hold your hands out like you're receiving a gift. It's the gift of salvation. You can't earn it. You just receive it. I lift my hands. Here's why. It doesn't just mean I surrender, I give up. It's, you know, tonight I'll get home about 930 my youngest son, will, he'll see the lights hit the driveway and he'll look out the window till I park the car and as soon as I get out the door, he's going to come running at me full blast with his arms lifted and he'll jump in my arms. That's how you're coming to God today. You're coming to him like a little child. You're coming to him to, to jump into the arms of God. Uh, those of you that are in front especially, but I'd like everybody in the room to pray this with us. Say, Lord Jesus Christ, today I give you everything. I give you my past, I give you my present, and I give you my future. 
I admit I'm a sinner. I've broken your law. But today I confess and believe that you're my perfect Savior. That you died on the cross for my sins. And God raised you from the dead. Today I ask that you wash me in your blood. You forgive me of all my sins. Today that you would come into my life, Jesus. To be my Lord. To be my Savior. And my very best friend. And from this moment on, I choose to live for you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for loving me. Holy Spirit, I receive your gift right now. Fill me. Baptize me in your love and in your spirit today. In Jesus' name, amen.